Subway famous $5 footlongs. So many sublicious choices, like the delicioso spicy Italian. And when you enjoy any regular footlong, order one of the many Subway dollar footlong sidekicks, like 21 ounce drinks and tasty sides, just $1 each or less. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to BS Report. Uh, so much sports going on right now. Basketball playoffs, NHL playoffs, baseball, all kinds of stuff. So, of course, let's not talk about sports. Let's talk about Tribeca. Let's talk about ESPN's uh, affiliation with Tribeca and and a man who is a big part of that, Mr. Chris Connolly, one of our favorite podcast guests. What's happening? I am good, Mr. Simmons. Thank you for the shout out. Yes, you know, Tribeca, it's, one of my favorite New York neighborhoods. Well, you know what's funny is, you know, rarely do they ask me to pimp something from the company, uh-huh. mainly because they know I won't. Yes. But in this case, they were like, can you talk about Tribeca? Maybe with Connolly, he's hosting a panel. I'm like, yes, Chris Connolly, of course. Oh, you're too Any fine. excuse to talk to Chris Connolly. Well, we're, you know, some, you know, sometimes it's fun to be a pimp. Which so you're in New York. The three six mafia never really got into. <laughs> you're in New York City right now. Yes, I am. In fact, I am three blocks away from where I grew up right now. Cool. I grew up at 36 in Lexington. So when I'm in this neighborhood here, I, uh, you know, I bore hundreds of people with stories of where my bicycle was stolen and where I saw this movie and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Well, Tribeca is. We're taping this on a Tuesday. Tribeca officially starts tomorrow. That's correct. I am flying back. I'm leaving gorgeous L.A. weather behind for well, a couple yeah, days. I, I, well, I hear it's like super hot. I hear it's like been uh, like in the 90s there. So at least you're coming to something a little more spring-like yeah, and temperate. We had like a biblical magnolia-type rainstorm last night. So we got it all cleaned up and ready for you. Well, what happened? You went to South Africa? I went to South Africa for a week, yes. For what? Uh, doing a story for the Worldwide Leader, Time to World Cup 2010. Mm. about the soccer league that prisoners on Robben Island, political prisoners during apartheid, uh, formed while they were uh, in captivity, Uh, not only as a way to get recreation, but also in terms of the way they constructed the league, you know, the regulations and the constitutions, almost as a test for how they would run a government someday. You know, the the league was so structured in terms of... uh, its regulations, its constitutions, its grievance procedures, its judicial boards, waiver rules, pickup rules, you know, think of a fantasy league, you know, to the ultimate. Mm. And really what these brilliant guys were doing was figuring out how are we going to actually run the government someday. So we talked to a whole bunch of those guys, and uh, we had a great time down there in Cape Town. That sounds like a movie. It sounds like a Michael Caine movie from you know, 1983. I, 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 I kept saying it could be a, it could be a movie. We call it Ashley Strongheart, <laughs> and that would be the character of the guy who put the thing together. And the exciting thing would be that they would have to be like Jessica Alba as the representative of the Red Cross. Yeah, they always have to, or she's a nuclear scientist who is now dabbling with Red Cross work. Well, yeah, they have, you, know, you may yeah. keep me away now. You may keep <laughs> me away tomorrow. But let me tell you something. You will not be able to keep me away from this island. I am going to find out what's going on with these prisoners, and you will not be able to die their ultimate humanity for any longer. Is it is it possible that there are just ten movie ideas, and we've done them all in every possible direction, and now it's just over? No, we're going to do them all as same-sex thrillers. Then we're going to oh, do them yeah. all with Mickey Rourke. And we'll just keep doing them over and over again and getting it right. Yeah, I, I, I talked about this with Adam Crow on his podcast. I do have a theory that they're going to remake all the 80s movies. They've already remade a lot of them as black-themed movies. Yes, yes. And I always thought that would be the I I always used to say that I thought they should, before George and Brad got involved, I always thought that Ocean's Eleven, done as an all African American film, would be perfect. Yeah, that would have been good. Scarface, also, they've done. We've seen it white. We've seen it Cuban. Sure. And uh, I guess you could technically say we've seen it with New Jack City, but I don't. I, I don't know. I'm ready for the all female version. Maybe set in a boarding school. That'd be good. Well, I'm ready for. They're going to remake a lot of these '80s movies. Well, they are. I mean, with when, a gay when, theme. when I saw they were remaking Bright Lights, Big City, you know, yeah. with with. 
the OC guy, what is it, Josh Schwartz in the yes. in the rector's chair? That was the sign that what you're saying is absolutely right, you know? Well, maybe we should just – see, there should be a committee. And by the way, you and I should both be on it. But <laughs> Above all. And then no one else. How about that? Yeah, I, I want them to rem- remake movies that should have worked and didn't. Exactly, yes. Exactly. So I, I'm, I'm totally on board with Bright Lights, Big City because that's a movie that – it's still unclear why it didn't work. You know, it should have worked. You had yeah. Michael J. Fox had a really good point in his career. You had a hot book. You had cocaine. You had New York City. How does that movie not work? Uh, you know, uh, you know, James Bridges was not an untalented director. You know, he did. Um, right. You know, he did Urban Cowboy. He did. Uh, you know, but he also did Mike's Murder, which didn't do so well. So hmm. conceivably, there were some issues there. You know. Yeah, but but I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, Kiefer Sutherland is Ted Allagash. You know, the sort of the bad influence on the hero. And hell, oh, he, could play, he could play that role now. Forgot yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I was watching A Few Good Men at like two in the morning this weekend. Oh yeah, my gosh! Lord knows I haven't watched that enough over the course of my life. I'm not just rewatching movies I've seen two hundred times. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you think that Kevin Pollak after that movie should give the Lou Gehrig speech? Well, I, it's funny. I was I thinking about that. I consider myself the luckiest. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. I was thinking about that, that he probably tells people now that he was one of the leads in that movie. No, you were in that. Him. Really? You were in the No, you were What? <laughs> but I was thinking what a crazy cast that was. And you would Kiefer Sutherland there as Lieutenant Kendrick, who's in like four scenes, but basically playing Jack Bauer with a crew cut. Totally. Only we don't know who Jack Bauer is yet. He's still 10 years away from being conceived. Right. But he's Jack Bauer with a southern accent and a crew cut. <laughs> and then you have... Noah Wiley, who's like right, barely in throw in. it. Noah yeah. Wiley is the throw-in to the trade, right? And, Ju- and Junior Gooding. That's, don't forget him. Right. I call him Junior Gooding now. I don't call him Cuba. Yeah. Um, he's well, the in there. the funny thing is that guy, you know, what was it, Wolfgang Hedison? Is that his name? God, oh, yeah. You know, those, yeah. Both of those guys who were the defendants were expected to become big stars. Yes, you James remember, Marshall remember, and the yeah, other remember guy. Remember, he was in the first Gladiator. Yes. You know, and that was supposed to – Columbia really thought that was going to be a big movie. And then the other guy was very, you know, very talented. And for whatever reason, they don't seem to have, uh, you know, become the big stars that we thought. But they certainly were expected to do very well, yeah? Well, you know what I – you know, that was right around when Will Smith's career was taken off. Oh. And when you look at that movie, that easily could have been a Will Smith part. Wow. And now you're talking about maybe the the most star-studded cast of all time. It's a very funny. I was watching it on TNT HD. Right. So they had to cut out a couple swears. Okay. Which, it, which makes it really interesting with every Nicholson scene. <laughs> Although apparently there's a YouTube clip that my buddy Sal forwarded me. Not apparently. I watched it. Right. Um, FX is, I think FX is now showing snakes on a plane. So the oh, icon- yes, I heard about this. Yeah. <laughs> the iconic Sam Jackson line is now like, I want to get these monkey flying snakes off this <laughs> monkey butt plane. You, know? well, you might as well go with it, right? Go the whole way. <laughs> or, or bleep it. I mean, you, you know, you know, you know, it's, but it's, this is a great thing. You know, you sort of, you know, the other interesting thing about a few good men is seeing is a little like American president. It's like watching. You have such a consciousness now, a viewer, of how Aaron Sorkin dialogue works. Right. Having watched all those things, and and you're seeing guys who are having their first experience with it. Yep. You know, and and there they not everyone gets the rhythms. You know, Nicholson yeah, it's true. gets it. You know, Nicholson is really good, but but we're so used to. We're so used to hearing how lines should be said that sometimes things fall, things fall wrong. I noticed it more in the American President than I noticed in Few Good Men, but it's it's something you can watch for. Yeah, American President was, in my opinion, a mild lost opportunity. Really, could have been a great movie. I don't know where the wheels came off. I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure what I would have changed, but it didn't 100 percent work. There, there may be some casting issues. Yeah, maybe. There. You know, it's a little, it's a little. Uh, it's a little stiff by the by the standards, um, but you know you know you're talking about how you remake those movies. The one I always loved is to think about that way was Taps. Do you remember Taps? Yes. Here's the thing: if I said to you, I said to you, here are the three stars of Taps: Tim Hutton, Tom Cruise, and Sean Penn. All here early the, in their career. Right. Here are the three characters they're going to play. One will be the leader. One will be the crazy guy. One will be the conflicted person in the middle. Which one of those guys will play those roles? You yes. wouldn't get it in a. You wouldn't. You know, you'd need nine tries to get it right. Well, Cruz should have played the leader. Yep. Sean Penn should have played the crazy guy, right. and Tim Hutton should have played the conflicted guy. Exactly. 
But they screwed up because Tim Hutton was coming off Ordinary People. Yes. And everybody was talking about what a hot star he was. That's and, right. And 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 Tim, uh, you know, and Tom Cruise was a was a uh, you know was a Lou Gehrig Wally Pip situation. The kid who was playing that, I don't know yeah. who it was, like got subbed out. So oh, it all it all happened in a, you know. And if Tom Cruise had taken all the roles he was offered then, he would have been, you know, the Christopher Walken of his time. He would have played all the crazy guys. I was watching Ordinary People. We might have even talked about this on the last podcast. I'm getting old. Um, but Tim Hutton got Best Supporting Actor yeah. for a movie he was in 90% of the time. Yeah. And yet Anthony Hopkins got Best Actor for a movie he was in for 17 minutes. The, the You know, the MVP in, in baseball and basketball drives me nuts, but there's really no... Harder to understand process than the Oscars, but nobody, at the, nobody at the time thought that you know, it's 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 you know it's about how whether you make the most of your innings, and you did have to say that Anthony Hopkins, you know, at least at the time, maxed out on every second he was on screen. Hmm. Hutton, that's another you know, the thing about Hutton is Hutton Hutton in that movie, and it's been a long time since I've seen it, but Hutton in that movie is totally acted upon, you know. Those scenes with the shrink, it's they're kind of reminiscent of the Goodwill Hunting scenes, aren't they? But um, the, uh, actually, very reminiscent, you know, like it, to the point that um, there's even kind of the "it's not your fault, it's right. not your fault." That scene's in there. It's a little, little, I don't know. Close but he's so, to the line. he's so he's so frail, he's so victimized, you know, yeah. that you couldn't imagine that would be a lead performance. Do you know, they, you, know, you know, you can always tell when you see a movie. I always yeah. have this theory when you see like a horror movie and you go. Wow, the male lead in that horror movie, that's a good job for him. He doesn't usually get those parts. I wonder why he got that lead. And it's always because he's a wimp in the movie. Huh. Male actors won't play wimpy characters, so you have to go way down the list. That's how, you know, the Luke Wilson of the world will wind up with leads sometimes. Well, you do, you worry, do you worry about where movies are going? Because, it, you know, I, I watched Ordinary People like two months ago, and I was just thinking, like, this movie was... Yeah, same for Kramer versus Kramer a year, a year or two years before. But these are the types of movies that really resonated for, with that generation. Yeah. And yet, if they made them now, they would star like Mark Ruffalo, and they would be independents, and you'd see them on IFC one night at midnight, and be like, "Wow, that was a good movie." But it would make like two bucks. Yeah, or you know, or it wouldn't even get made for the big screen at all. You know, it would get made for. Uh... You know, ordinary people would have been a you know a very special lifetime movie. You know. Yeah, true. Like Mark Ruffalo, who, in my opinion, has had one of the most fascinating careers of the last twenty years. He's either done really really cool indie projects or just completely sold out. And it's there's never been a middle ground. It's just he's either the boyfriend in a horrible Drew Barrymore picture. Or he's like the conflicted brother who comes home, who chain smokes, who smokes pot and lives at Laura Linney's house and uproots her life. There's no in between. He's just one of those two. But I feel like any, like there's four Mark Ruffalo movies that, or is it Ruffalo or Ruffalo? I think you were right the first time. Yeah, Ruffalo. Uh, Ruffalo. Um, if, if any of those movies had come out in 1980, he's like nominated for an Oscar. Yeah, yeah. No, it's I mean, it's a different he, era. You know, well, I mean, a lot, but a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, ordinary people is is just based on the quality of those. The one thing, you know, and remember, ordinary people gets a lot of grief in the aftermath because it won all. It won the best picture Oscar over um, Raging Bull that year, which so, is an outrage. Which yes, which is certainly an outrage, but it's not the same thing as saying it's a bad movie. But in right. retrospect, people always go, "Well, it was the Academy thinking." The thing that that Redford, the direct, you know, who directed, was so good was that he really understood like those faces. And how he felt about him, and so you've got Mary Tyler Moore and Donald Sutherland, and then you have those angelic faces of Tim Hutton and Elizabeth McGovern. I mean, mm. just the, the 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 pictures of innocence and and frailty. You know, um, they, he did a nice job, you know, casting them. Even and is it wasn't the brother somebody? The brother, hmm, the brother who was I, I. Or maybe I'm thinking of Stand by Me. Stand by Me. John Cusack's the brother. Oh, okay. Have, but I think his brother in this movie was somebody who's. Famous, I can't huh. remember. Like the, like Kevin Costner being the, uh, the yeah. dead guy at the beginning of the Big Chill or something. Or how about Kevin Costner being in the big bachelor party scene in the morgue in Night Shift? <laughs> Is that right? I yeah, and like know pouring really? pouring right? shots down Michael Keaton. Sorry, yes, Kevin Costner. <laughs> Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Did not. That's a Ron Howard picture, isn't it? 
Uh, yeah, it was his first one. Am I, am I, well, before, after Grand Theft Auto. Did you see Ron Howard was a guest on Bill Maher two weeks ago? Mm-hmm. I hear, Bill Maher, I hear, I hear the, the Vatican is after him. Is that right? Oh, is that true? Well, he feels that's true because of these oh, Dan yeah. Brown movies, but you're saying. Well, it, Bill Maher usually his show is stru- structured a specific way. In this show, he just had two guests. One of them was Ron Howard. He had Ron Howard on for like 25 minutes. Ron Howard seems like, yeah, it's, we're looking at these guys from afar. We don't really know them. But yeah. he seems like he's one of the more normal right. Hollywood people who's worth $400 million or whatever it is. But, <laughs> yes. um, but I was thinking as I was watching it, you know, you think of all the child actors who got effed up. Yeah. And it's like maybe 39 out of every 40 is just effed up for life. Yeah. Ron Howard. Yeah. Not only not effed up. Totally fine, successful, a huge director, has his head on straight, has a nice family. <laughs> I know. How I know. did he escape this? Is it, Who, is it something, you know? You would have thought Ron Howard out of anybody would have been the most screwed up because right. he, he yeah. had it twice. Yeah, he, looks like, he looks like Brad Renfro ready to happen. Yeah. You know, like I was getting high while Andy and Don Knotts were, you know, were doing <laughs> their thing. And, you know, I had I had the, all the girls over from Donna Reed show one day, and I didn't even want to talk about what happened <laughs> except it's a good thing we kept it. I mean, you can imagine all the stories that never happened. I want to read a book about child actors and people trying to figure out where it goes wrong and where it goes right. You know, like, I'm, I'm, you know, it's like it's it's interesting. You know, you one, you know, it's a it's a crapshoot, isn't it? You know, he had a great family. Like his father was an actor and he was a cool guy, and of course his brother, the great Clint Howard, the MTV uh, uh, Movie Award winner for Lifetime Achievement one year, was obviously a hardworking actor, but. And he, remember, he had the two gigantic TV hits, right? Two. Well, at different had, points he, of his life. Yeah, and and uh, and so maybe maybe he never had the long time in the. But he's just a stable guy, a smart guy. You know, I remember mm. somebody asked him once, "What do you? You know, you just seem just like you were saying, like a stable guy. What do you do that we would be shocked by?" Um, and he said, uh, "Sometimes I dance around the house naked." Wow. So try to get that image out of your mind. Yeah, it's a little frightening. Yeah, I'm trying to think who the Mount Rushmore. Of most well-adjusted child actors are, and he's definitely on it. I don't you got know him. I mean, while well, you got him, you got uh, you got Jodie Foster, of course. I would say. Yeah, she's she's had like a kind of a weird career though. Like I, you know, the accused was two, on two Oscars not enough for you. Well, I, cover I'm not, cover of Time for a directorial debut. I'm not sold on the accused as an Oscar performance. That was on recently, and that that is a lifetime movie. That movie. It's a okay. terrible movie. And it's it's kind of the same thing with the Halle Berry Monster Ball. She had a scene in it where she really went over the top with it, with what she endured in the scene. Mm-hmm. For Halle Berry, it was whatever right. happened in that sex scene with Billy Bob Thornton. We'll never know. It sure seemed like they had sex. But it was so raw. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, she's got the Oscar. But basically, she just had sex with a guy in film. Um, Jodie Foster, the pinball scene, it was so... It was just so tough to watch. I think people, yeah. yeah, she's the Oscar winner. But it actually wasn't that great of a a role or a movie. I, don't, I mean, well, it's been a while since I've seen it. I think I liked it more than you did. I think, you know, I don't think, she, you know, I think that's probably true what you say about, you know, Halle Berry, that that scene got her the Oscar. I'm not sure. No question. I'm not sure that that scene got Jody Foster the Oscar in the same way. Remember, this was a child actor who'd yeah. been through a lot and was also known as being, you know, highly intelligent and well educated and all that. And so her playing that kind of, you know, tough girl, um, you know, street type character was a stretch for her. And so she also got points for that, you know. Yeah, I guess. So, I, I don't think it was an Oscar winner. In Silence of the Limbs, I don't know. First of all, her accent's terrible. It's a bad southern accent. Dr. Locker. Dr. Locker. Like, it's just not good. It's a bad accent. You shouldn't win an Oscar for having a bad accent. If you could win Oscars for bad a- accents, then Kevin Costner would have, like, six. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tried to watch, well, no, you wouldn't, you know, you ever tried to watch uh, uh, the movie version of West Side Story? No. This is one of the most acclaimed films of all time, right? I mean, you know, uh, but... The person who dubbed uh, the singing voice of Natalie Wood has the most god awful accent. Oh no! Has tried, and it just it makes the film unwatchable for me. So I certainly know what it's like to have an accent ruin a movie. All right. Well, I'll give you Jodie Foster. So we got Ron Howard and Jodie Foster. Okay. 
Um, does Joseph Gordon Levitt? He kind of might make it. Mount Rushmore. When um, when you have, when when you have. Uh, he's the only guy from the from the last two decades that seems like he might end up having a career. Really. Wow. Yeah, he's leading a movie in this summer. You know, I'm, 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 I, I will admit I'm here trying to think, and of course it's sad, but the names that come to mind are always one that goes, ooh, that was too bad. Ooh, that's a shame. Ooh, sorry about that. Ooh, I got, I got number four, Danny Bonaducci. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'd be better Mount Rushmore as the least well-adjusted <laughs> child actor. So Ladies and be gentlemen, honor. please. That's yeah. right. Please welcome. It's the tough though. George I mean, Judy Garland All Stars. <laughs> think about how messed up you are, just in general, if you're a teenager, yeah. and how many different things you have going. You got hormones, you got emotions, and then to to throw fame and acclaim, and all the stuff that goes with celebrity, and then have it taken away. Yeah. There's yeah. no, no yeah. coming back. I, from I, that. Not to mention how messed up your relations with your uh, your parents are. You know, because uh, of the financial implications of what you're doing and all the rest of it. So, that, I, I'm, I've been fascinated with LeBron James lately, and it started with the 60 Minutes profile. Right. Which I don't know. Did you see it? Sure. But what, what really fascinated me was his life was a lot more broken growing up. Like his childhood was a lot more broken than I think people realize. Right. His childhood was basically no different than somebody like Omar Stoudemire's. Childhood. Like a mom who, you know, they do a very nice job of keeping her out of the limelight a little bit, but clearly had some issues and he bounced around. He was living in different houses. Yep. They didn't have money. And this guy emerges from all of this as one of the most loyal to everybody who's been close to him athletes that we've seen. I think he's handled himself extraordinarily well, extraordinarily well. Like he's been famous since he's yeah. you know, 15. Yeah. And has a really good sense of who he is and who is important to him and and who should be who he should surround himself with. Yeah, I mean, and 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 you, as you of course know, we we uh, we ladle on the personal qualities in direct correlation to how well they play the game. You know, yes. If they were if they were you know the twelfth man on the bench, we we wouldn't be saying all these things. But you know, I've done a fair amount of interviewing you know of people sixteen, seventeen who are thrown into. The spotlight, and usually they're the act. In my career, usually they've been the actors that we've been talking about. And I was on the red carpet at the ESPYS, and we, you know, when LeBron was in high school, and and he came up to be interviewed. And I, I promise you, there was something about his presence. Yep. There was something about him that was really completely unique to me. He was so poised. He was so calm. I mean, I was, re- I, you know, I never expected to. Fe- I was totally floored. By how how he was dealing with all of it, like I I, I started babbling about people afterwards. He just seemed so together, you know. Yeah. Because that will overwhelm anybody. I mean, we did we did Dwight Howard for the same thing that, and he was you know he was just a little shy by the whole crazy thing, you know, sensational player, but just not not down at the moment. But he was, I guess they're just those guys who just say it's on me, you know. The family's yeah. messed up, and it's on me, you know. I'm the guy who's going to get us out of this, and. Maybe that's where he came from. I don't know. I noticed the same thing. I think it was the 2004 ESPYs. I took my wife. So he would have been, I guess, 19. Mm-hmm. He was a rookie. He just finished his rookie year. Right. And, you know, they had that old setup at the Hollywood Highland where it was like the five floors and you could eat on the deck and yes. food. And we were eating and he just happened to sit at our table with a couple of people. Right. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't bother him. We didn't talk to him. But... I was kind of wa- kind of watching out of the corner of my eye how he handled himself with everybody and the people that came up to him, and he just seemed very mature to me. Yeah. Just there's there's something about the way, and you know, we always had the joke back then that he was really 28. Right, like like the like the, the Greg the Greg, the o- Greg Oden. 1.0 joke, yeah. Yeah, but this is somebody that, as a personality, was way ahead of where he should have been. And even, you know, I have I used to I have all these Letterman tapes from. 82 to 87 i used to like tape interviews i liked and put them yeah you should see it it's really it's it's a testament to the fact that i didn't have a girlfriend um <laughs> just tape after tape of viewer mail and <laughs> and, and wasn't fixing to get one any <laughs> yeah and, and it wasn't helping real soon yeah yeah tape and letterman segments wasn't exactly helping me with the ladies um but i had this michael jordan interview we'll that be he back did with brothers theater after this. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh-huh i had this jordan interview that he did when jordan was a rookie and you forget Jordan was not the most polished property. Yeah, right. And it took him 
three, four years maybe to get to the level that LeBron was at as a rookie. Like he, you know, he's, he wasn't as articulate as I think that we remember him. He wasn't as confident. Right. Um, and this is a guy who came from a two parent family that was a lot more stable than LeBron. So LeBron, I, you know, the way that he affects his teammates, and I wrote about it a little bit in my MVP mm-hmm. comp, but the, the way he interacts with them, they really, Magic Johnson's the only guy that I think can compare from a chemistry standpoint that his teammates just love him. They love playing with him. He loves playing with them. He wants to make them better. He's not, you know, he's selfish right. only when the team needs him. Um, Magic, you have to give you have to give the nod to just because he came into a situation where he was not, you know, the designated the alpha male. Yeah. You know, they had plenty of alpha males, and so the fact that he was able to, the fact that he was able to take on that role even with the guys around him is an even greater achievement. Well, but and here, funny, but, yeah. oh, but here's the thing about Magic, and I t- talk about this in my book. Um, you forget this too. Magic was considered a home wrecker his third season. He got his he got a twenty five million dollar contract, right, twenty five right. years. Basically decided on like a Wednesday night they lost to the, some team in November of the eighty two season, and he said, "You know, I want to get traded. I can't handle this guy anymore." Guy gets fired the next day. Magic gets booed at every Laker game for the next two months. He is considered the poster boy of the petulant NBA. This guy only cares about himself. What happened to this guy? And it took him maybe a year, two years, just to kind of shed that. Hmm. That's interesting. I, um, I, I mean, I remembered the, the skeleton of that, but I wouldn't have remembered all that stuff there. Yeah, there's. If you go into the SI vault, you know they have they, they have basically every article they've ever. Oh, wrote. I've, I've been I've, I've been I've yeah, been you've been in deep. deep I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I read that first Dick Butka story from the University <laughs> yeah. of Illinois. I hoovered that whole thing up. Yeah, you know the, uh, Bill Knack is the editor in chief of the local Daily Illini in that piece. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's a mat. If you search for Magic Johnson, I'm going to say like November 1981, and there's just a story that just just eviscerates wow. him about what a selfish jerk he is, basically. Now you were talking about Jordan, and we were talking about 60 Minutes. Do you remember the famous Jordan was the first guy who got the 60 Minutes treatment? Of the athlete. Do you remember what their hook on Jordan was? That was some, wasn't something about Nike. He did his own vacuuming. Oh no, I don't remember that. That was how sixty minutes came at Jordan. What a guy! He's an he's an elite athlete, and he does his own vacuuming, and he does his own sewing. Ugh. That was their hook. <laughs> Can you believe it? Do you see LeBron? Do you see him as as a student of human nature? That you are. Do you see him leaving Cleveland? Because I've I've gone full circle or half circle on this, and I now do not think he will leave. I don't know, but I no I I I think there. I guess I would say there is some. Uh, I would be aware of some sentimentality in the way you were looking at him. You know, I I think I think great people want to succeed on the greatest stage. Yep. And so you know, if somebody came down to him and said. Have you seen what's happened with the Knicks over a generation? Let me pull you out a tape and show you what happens when a great team plays for New York. You know, here's the DeBusher, Bradley, Willis Reed, Walt Frazier, Dick Barnett, Knicks. How would you like to do something like that on the greatest stage possible? Yeah. I don't know how a, a you know, a head and shoulders athlete like, like him says no to that. My friend Paul Hersheimer from the NBA had a theory early on this season that he didn't think LeBron would leave. Unless they won the title, because he grew up there, and he is, you know, very aware of the whole Cleveland curse, all the bad things that have happened, and does not want to be lumped into that as the guy who couldn't win the title, ditched them, and then won a title with the Knicks. He would then become the poster boy of 55 years of failure, or whatever it's been. Hmm. I thought that was interesting. I think Jose Mesa is the poster boy for 55 <laughs> years of failure, don't you? Oh, isn't it Rocky Calavito? <laughs> hey, don't knock the rock. <laughs> is it... You I guess it was. Drunk. I guess it was maybe the agent who convinced Jim Brown that he could be a movie star. He was right. I saw the. I saw the, the Dirty Dozen right when it came out, and the, uh, we, were, we were summering in Leonia, New Jersey. And my gosh, I went off there. Trini Lopez dies in that film faster than they used to die on Police Squad. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Police Squad? They used to go to special yeah. guest star John Belushi. And he'd be a die. chalk outline in the floor 30 seconds in. <laughs> Trini, Trini Lopez dies like before you find out who wrote it. It's a, hey. And the other great thing about the, Daily, about the Dirty Dozen is the use 
in place of the of the standard profanity of the word lover. Ooh. This is something that maybe your snakes on a plane people ought to try. What John is, Cassavetti is saying, that lover. Well, what I could a, take that lover and do something pretty bad with that lover. One of the creepiest words, I think, in the English language right now, along with anytime sexy is used in a sports context. <laughs> <laughs> Always creeps me out. <laughs> uh, Matthew Barry is using it, don't you? <laughs> well, Matthew Barry uses it a lot, and it always makes me angry. Um, I yeah, I wrote that. something in my mailbag. I wanted to get your take on this, but unfortunately, I'm trying to find which one it was in. But something about stories that would have been a lot bigger if they happened now in the ESPN era. Well, should we begin with Fritz Peterson and Mike Kekich? Oh, that's a good one. Tell tell the listeners that one because people Peterson might not remember and Mike that. Mike Kekich were pitchers for the New York Yankees who swapped wives. Or as they put it, didn't just swap wives, but swapped lives. And families. Yes, families, the whole deal. There was one iconic picture that looked like a shot from the last days of Sheila of the four of them on a boat together. And these were all really good-looking people. And they were pitching on the same staff. And they they came right out and they said that they'd swapped families. You know, and, and, and I think Dick Young's head just about exploded here, who was the... You know, who is the My America columnist for the Daily News. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know if anybody was up to the challenge of writing about it all. That but, is you know, a documentary. Saying, so what's the big deal? I, I don't get it. What's the deal? <laughs> it's like. It's like, wow. It's like the ice storm in pinstripes. <laughs> <laughs> without the without the tragic death of the... Without the tragic death of young Elijah Wood, yes. <laughs> that could have been a documentary. It w- I mean, it, you know, it would have... In the right It, it would have ground America to a halt. Yes. I mean, it would have, it would have, you know, it, it would have, it would have been wall-to-wall coverage on every blog and every, you know, not to mention they'd have all been multimillionaires. All right, I found the part in my mail back. So this reader, Mark from Seattle, writes, "The biggest non-internet era sports stories that would have made the internet or ESPN explode." Here's my rudimentary list. I'll go: Magic and HIV. Right. Jordan Jordan retires the first time. Now that's an underrated one because it would have the whole conspiracy thing would have come out a lot earlier than it did. And people, well, why is this guy really retiring? You just kind of talked about it on talk radio back then. Now we'd have blogs devoted to why he actually retired. Um, Wilt scoring a hundred. I didn't agree with that so much. The Wilt scoring hundred. Yeah, I don't I think agree I with that either. Now. I didn't think that was such a big deal. The OJ car chase, obviously. Kermit's punch, no question. Yes, that's true. And then he said Hatch catching a penalty kick to save the Allies in victory. That's a good example. <laughs> I threw in the Ron Marischal repeatedly hitting Ron, John Roseboro over the head with his bat. Yeah, that was that would have been a big deal. Yes, people and, don't even know about that now. You know, it got you know it did get you know where it got huge coverage. You know, in what was then like the Macy's window of American culture was Life magazine. Life magazine played it huge. I remember because I remember mm. looking at those pictures. But really? I've never, you know, I admit I've never seen like a tape of it. No, I don't I've think it exists. I've seen those still photographs of number twenty-seven Marischal with the bat and Roseboro, you know. But the thing was, you know, Roseboro walked off the field. Yeah, you know, he was holding now. he was holding his head, but he walked off the field. It's the kind of thing like like Rudy T, you know, where you know where someone gets hurt, like someone gets hurt in a wrestling match, appears to get hurt in a wrestling. Match. That would be the thing that would spark the outrage. You know what would be like that? What was that? Was it was it Minnesota and Ohio State, the yeah, college the basketball teams that had yep. the big fight? That would be huge. That's a good one, and that, and that's also on YouTube. Brewer and Witty, and I and what uh, Winfield was involved in that. Too, Dave Winfield it? was involved. It is actually an amazing clip to watch, and it, it's impossible to believe that any of them were allowed to still compete in the NCAA after is that. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, it's pretty. It's really bad. Wow. Um, the Bruins climbing into the MSG stands to fight the Rangers. That yep. would have been the that was the pre our test melee basically. That's true. Yes, um, but you know that was hockey. You know, yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I remember what those Bruins Ranger games were like. That was that. Yeah. Was, that was like uh, those the, the that that was like an ongoing. That was like an hour long version of that feeling you got right before the our test melee. Yes. Started like you remember if you were watching that game before anything that happens. It was bad, you know, and Mike Breen called it. There was bad mojo in the room. Mm. Like they should have been sent to their rooms with however many seconds to go, five minutes before the art thing happened. That was what those Ranger Bruin games were like back then. 
It's kind of like what actually with the Bruins Canadian series is like right now. Is the that Bruins right? I, three, I haven't yeah. watched any of it yet. You know, I I just I just keep seeing too many men on the ice, and you know, mm. and, the Bruins uh, are up three nothing, and in my prediction, game four, I think Montreal is just going to turn it into uh, a street fight, huh? And try to turn the series around. Who, the other who one, was it who assassinated Richard Zednick? That one game was that a Bruins Canadians game? Like maybe three or four years ago. Oh, where, yeah. Where you can tell Zednick is out in the air. Yes. That he was a bad one. And he's like, and he's, and he's passed out in the air. That was. That well, was there was one. When was I was stunning. growing up, the Bruins had a guy who got basically, he got it was a high sticking incident. Ted Green. He got, in a, he got in a stick fight with Wayne Mackey. Yeah, that was, a, that was a stick fight. That was the old days when you could have stick fights. But then there was another one. I think the guy's name was Henry Boucher. It was Dave Forbes and Henry Boucher, mm-hmm. and uh, somebody was unconscious, and it was one of those things the guy wasn't looking when. Right. When it, I think Boucher played for Minnesota, and Dave Forbes played for the. Yeah, he was charged with aggravated assault in 1975 after butt ending Henry Boucher's eye socket in a game. Wow. He was acquitted after jury could not reach a verdict, and if you remember, yeah, they made they kind of stole this idea and made it into a terrible TV movie with Michael Moriarty. <laughs> Michael Moriarty. Yeah, the same. They basically ripped off the incident. Um, anyway, the the one that I didn't come up with, I said the blacks, the Black Sox would be the clear number one. Yeah, for, that didn't. I have to say that didn't. That didn't. I remember you saying that 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 didn't feel like what what it was. But it sounds like you've got one. What is it? A reader suggests this, and I don't mean to make light of this because it was one, you know, really one of the most horrible things that ever happened. But I think the Munich massacre in the seventy two Olympics trumps everything. Hmm. Well, for, I, for a two day, basically, you know, every country being held hostage just by the situation for two days, the worst possible aftermath, the Jim McKay part, and then you know the family. I think that story goes on for like five years. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deny the gravity of you know. Of course, I'm gonna appreciate the gravity of what you're saying. But what I thought was interesting about your idea was what in this culture would would hit every base like what oh would, yeah what would what would people who you know people who watch 2020 people who watch oprah people what would what would like hit them across the board and this mm. thing you're, this thing you're talking about wouldn't quite qualify that way munich wouldn't quite qualify yeah that you're way. right it's too tragic almost it you, is might, tragic you might be and right it, and it feels like a political act you know it was a pol- it was an act of political terrorism you know so um, maybe the answer is magic and hiv because that hits every demo we're looking for you still don't have enough i mean with the obvious exception perhaps you don't have enough women involved you know you it's like well if you want to if you want to go across the board if you want a story that gets everybody you need nicole brown simpson you need Lacey Peterson. You oh. need like you need like some figure that the other part of the universe attaches itself to. You don't think that was his wife? I mean, she was pregnant with his baby when the whole thing broke, uh, and then know, everyone was worried whether the baby had HIV or not. I'm, I'm sure that's true. I you know I I uh, I, I feel like I'm going to stand on Kekich and Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> just just as something that would just blow everything up. Where like anyone who had a blog, anyone who had a TV show would have to have an opinion about it. No one could get away with not, oh, so what wow. do you think of the peterson Kekich thing? You know, and Coulter would have a take, Rush Limbaugh would have a take, you know, uh, Bill Maher would have a take, there'd be gags aplenty, you know, there'd be well, four different people to follow, they'd follow the kids at school. I mean, mm. that, that would be a flooding the zone moment, I think. You're kind of talking me into it, although I think maybe that's the goofiest story that, Right, I, and, and maybe I'm drawn to the to the you know the sense that nobody died and nobody and the got mustaches. Really, yeah, nobody got really sick, so it'd be fun. And the well, mustaches too. You know, Fritz went on inexplicably to becoming the color commentator on radio for the New York Golden Blades of the WHA, despite as far as I know, having no hockey background whatsoever. You could look it up. Wow, that's weird. You know, not, the more I'm thinking about it, the OJ trial would have been would have hit everything we're looking for. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it, it, either that YouTube that, clips, yeah. um, blogs, rumors, and the Kardashians would have figure. become famous much faster. <laughs> I mean, like people used to talk about Kevin Bacon. The Kardashians are like, you know, the, the Kardashians look like a crime syndicate in terms of their connection <laughs> to tabloid stories. You can get to any tabloid story of the last twenty years in two moves to a Kardashian. Did you ever think that MTV would, you know, you were there with MTV from the get go? Well, not quite from the get-go. Well, after, from within the first five years. Yes, I guess that's right, yeah. 
And now it's basically the signature shows on MTV are, or the signature stars, I should say, are Lauren Conrad, who has no talent at all, Spencer, Heidi, and, uh, and whatever the other pseudo celebs they have on these other right, shows. Right. That's right. Yeah. That wasn't really like the mission statement of MTV that this was the direction they were going. <laughs> no, no, but you know, uh, like Joni Mitchell says in The Last Time I Saw Richard, only a phase, these dark cafe days. It won't stay that way forever, right? Right. You know, same thing happened at Rolling Stone. You, if, you're, if you're into youth culture, you have to follow youth culture. And we just all grew up thinking, A, that newspapers would never go away, and B, that music would always be the way that young people define themselves against the culture of their parents. Mm. And then guys like you and me showed up, and we wanted to listen to all the music the kids were listening to. So you didn't get to, like, use your music to keep your parents away. Now your parents wanted to know, like, who T.I. was, and that ruins everything. So yeah. with that going away, how else was, you know, young people needed a different way to delineate themselves from. Well, you have, you have young children. How, yes, do, do. how, do, young, how do the teenagers define themselves now? Well, you'd, say, you'd probably say video games, right? You know, they, you know, wow. video, you know in, in terms of, like, the cluelessness of the adult, you know. Like, what do you, you know, what do you, what do grown-ups not know how to do? Well, we don't really understand, you know, texting, and we don't understand, like, we don't, we don't play Halo that much. Or if you see a guy, play, if you see a man playing Halo with his kid, you go, interesting. <laughs> or, yeah. Or Grand Theft Auto, you know, that kind of thing. I still think you're giving a little too much credit to adults for um, how they like music. I think there's a very small minority of 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 people over 35 who stay in touch with the music. I think the overall idea is that the baby boomers refuse to leave the stage. You know, that they still, that even as they get into their 50s and 60s, they still want to be the most significant people in the culture. You know, yeah, and, and, that means, and that means reaching towards the things that young people seem to like because they're the consumers that the world is aimed at. Yeah, but the, see, here's where, here's where I disagree. Like Bruce was in town last week. Yes. I love Bruce. Yeah. He he meant as much to me as any en entertainer, athlete, anybody. Yeah. You know, yes. anybody that and I yes. don't know personally. Yeah. Um I I think he was so good that you could release a book of just of the lyrics of his songs and people would be blown away by it. I've bought that book. <laughs> that book exists? I've, I've read that book. Yes, What's that the book, book exists. Called? And it's in his handwriting, which is even better. Oh, well, I'm I own that book. It. I may have been given that book by my sister-in-law for her birthday I'm or buy Christmas. It. I still that's, think, a, that's a book to have, yeah. I still think uh, The River. Yes. You know, which is one of his more popular songs, which when something becomes too popular, then, you you know, it's not as cool to... The, the lyrics to The River rank right up there for me with anything anybody's written. Uh, you know, you're... You'll get no argument from me. It's, I have, it's I have actually the most a movie. Satisfying relationship. I've never met him, and I have the most satisfying relationship with him that I have with any popular artist ever. Yeah. It's a movie. The River could easily be made in a movie called The River, and it would be depressing, and it would probably star – actually, they could have done it 28 years ago, and it would have starred Meryl Streep as the wife. I would have gone with Sissy Spacek. Or Sissy Spacek would have been good, yeah. <laughs> um, but also Tunnel of Love has some awesome songs, too, and it – and I love that album because it it it's about the deconstruction of a relationship and how it goes south, and which married the woman he was dating or married to at the time, Julian Phillips. It would it's kind of an amazing album when you realize like this guy's realizes he's going to get divorced as he's working on this album. And you talked about how yeah, what it's like when the world is watching what you're doing. You know, to be able to be, you know, to be able to express those thoughts, whatever their connection to what he was actually going through at that time when er when he was one of the most famous people in the culture and everybody knew about his marriage and stuff is, you know, is that much more remarkable. And if I could go into a time machine and see one artist at any point of their career, I would go to see Bruce back in 1978, right before the river had come out, but when he was starting to play the songs, mm -hmm. when he was throwing probably about 101, he was like Steven Strasberg, <laughs> so 101, 102 with five pitches and did four-hour concerts yep. and was just like nothing anybody had seen before. Okay, so that's the you know that Agora part. show you can download if you if you're you know and and that's that's yeah. state of the art. That's exactly the period just, you're talking about. Yeah, just do Springsteen 1978 and you're not going to be disappointed. No. So with true. that backdrop, I'm about to say the following. I would never go see Springsteen now. I, you know, he was in town last week. If somebody could offer me free tickets, I would not have gone because 
It's the same reason I wouldn't want to watch Larry Bird and Magic Johnson play basketball right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I think this. Yeah, and I understand your feeling, and I I feel exactly the opposite. Um, Why? And so does my lovely. So does my loving family, especially my wife. Okay. Because in a way that sports doesn't allow, you know, you know, people die, people go on their way, but it's still it's still thrilling to see them all together. It's still a thrill that you know he's still in your life. That so many of the guys who you watched him play with. You know, for all this time, still get to play with them. Mm-hmm. You know, you can make the case. You know that I, I guess people could make the case that it's not this or it's not that. You know that it once was, but I would make that case. I just think you know it's like going to a family reunion now. It's like hmm. it's like how lucky you are that these guys who have been a part of your life for this long are still a part of your life. That they're still doing this thing. That you're still lucky enough to go see them. You know. And that these songs, when you, you know, these songs had such depth of human experience, and we heard them when we were teenagers. We heard them before we had kids. We heard them before we got married. And now, now you put all those feelings through your own life now, and you, and you just think, oh my, you know, how much deeper and richer these experiences are, even while they remind us of what we felt like when we, were, when we heard them when we were young. So it's a I, I think the experience has more resonance now in a lot of ways. Solid case. Um, I'm not against it. I'm happy that people go. I love Bruce. I mm-hmm. want him to live forever. I'm glad people go to his shows and enjoy it. Just me personally, I I would rather not see him at this point. I I think that's a legitimate call, and and fortunately that means more tickets for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think though, you know, like for instance, do you, you get the HD Net channel? I don't think that I do actually. No, I mean it's amazing because I get the rural free delivery channel, which is the greatest channel of all time. And I don't think I get the HD channel. Well, God bless Mark Cuban. And you want to talk about the most underrated Americans of the past 20 years. Mark Cuban gives the world streaming video. Yep. He redefines how an NBA owner should own a team. He gives us the HD net channel. And he gives us a really interesting blog that I like to read every day. So I'd like to thank him. And Dan, but, Rath- and Dan Rather's still working. So. And, Dan Rath- and he gave Dan Rather a job. I think that's and, all the way around. And he's given us just a, a, a boatload of unintentional comedy moments over the years. So totally I'd like to thank him for that. Um, but he owns HD Net, and on the weekends they run concerts. Okay. And some of the concerts are really good. Like, uh, for instance, they have a John Mayer acoustic concert from L.A. And I know it's like fun to bash John Mayer, but the guy's talented. He knows how to play guitar. And he's, does he tweet Aniston like in the middle of the? <laughs> he does it. Does a tweet? Does a tweet? Is there, is there any like? Is there any like you know inside Aniston stuff? You know, going on? No. Okay. All right. Well, what's what's funny is he's one of the few people that can shut my son up. If John Mayer's on, my son becomes like he goes into some sort of trance, which I don't know if he has a crush on John Mayer. I'm a little worried. Um, Interesting. Or he loves so guitar. What you're saying is he's taking out a kind of Raffi career now. Maybe he's going to be the, the cool kid in college who plays guitar and like gets babes. I'd be so happy. That would be nice. Yeah. But So anyway, they so this weekend they had Genesis on. Okay. And unfortunately, it was a Genesis from 1984. It was Genesis from 2008. <laughs> Phil Collins now with the shaved head, oh, carrying an boy. extra 20 pounds. Oh, um, boy. And he's, of course, these bands reach a point where they have to go to Europe because Europe is 20, 20 years behind the times, basically. They, did, yeah, they didn't have the 80s. They had the 70s twice. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Or you could go to, like, Vancouver. Vancouver's, like, in sure. 1988 right now. So Genesis did love. Um, so he's cranking out You're No Son of Mine, which, in my opinion, one of the 20 worst songs maybe ever. When you talk about lyrics, <laughs> the actual delivery of the song, like it's just an atrocity. Okay. And uh, he's holding out the mic for the Italian fans as they scream the chorus to your son of mine. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, I own five of their albums. Kill me. <laughs> it's just so bad. Oh, my God. They closed with uh, Invisible Touch. Of course they did. And uh, – Crowd just going bonkers, and I'm thinking like, wow, this wow. is where great bands go to die. HD no, I'll, I'll tell you where – well, okay. So I'm going down to Uruguay to do a story on the Andes plane crash, you know, survivors from the rugby team. What? For, when are you doing that? No, I, I did it. It's a, You can find it on the web. It's it's, oh. uh, it's an ESPN story from way back. And while we're in the Miami uh, airport, room, you know, uh, departure lounge, I notice what appears to be a rock band you know, getting their drink on a little bit. But I can't find the front man anywhere. Like, it all looks like guys in the van. And so we all get into business class, and one of the guy comes, one of the guys from the band comes up to me and 
gives me the greatest opening line I've ever gotten from anybody, which is, I don't know you, but you hate me. Uh Uh-oh. It was the guy from Toto. Oh. Apparently, and I only say this apparently because I don't remember it, remembering something that I wrote for Rolling Stone 25 years earlier. Wow. About the band. Oh. I don't know you, but you hate me. That's great. I know. know, It wasn't their fault. They came during that weird era, which was parodied so fantastically by the Yacht Rock series on whatever <laughs> web channel that was, but like that weird Michael McDonald, Kenny Loggins, Toto, Christopher Cross. Michael McDonald and Kenny Loggins were, were, were LeBron James and Michael Jordan compared look, to the look, guys in that band. Yeah. You're preaching to the choir. I, there is no bigger Michael McDonald fan than me. I'm no, just saying. Stephen Holden for the New York Times, but you're it, close, I'm sure. It was this weird, weird passive-aggressive Air of pop music. Yes, we called it the faceless bands back then. Yeah, yeah. and everybody kind of turned on Toto like it was their fault. And it's like they it wasn't yeah. their fault. They didn't mean to win the five Emmys or whatever it was. Yeah, the Grammys, I think they're called. Yeah. Oh, God, Grammys. Right. Yes. Right. For Rosanna and and so yeah. So the guys I was with saying, how many hits did they have? And I said, well, actually, they had three hits. Yeah. They had Africa, they had Rosanna, and they had Hold the Line. Yeah. In an earlier incarnation, but they also played all over Thriller, you know. So they do count. Well, I was talking to my buddy Jeff Gallo, who's the best man at my wedding, who loves bad music more than really anybody. And I was just telling him about this Genesis concert. And th- here's what I can't figure out, and I don't know where music is going in this respect. Mm-hmm. So Genesis has songs that, as, as time is revealed, are just horrible. Like They're just <laughs> terrible songs. But back at the time, we talked ourselves into these songs, and we did it with... You know, we did it with some of the songs on Thriller. Right. I did it. I know I did it with a lot of the Bruce songs. Like there was, you know, Darlington County. After the 98th listen, I'm like, yeah, Darlington County. It's a good tune. <laughs> but really, it's a terrible song. No, I like and, Darlington County. But well, I know what you mean, song. yeah. But, but the fact is, we just, because people listen to full albums back then, you talk yourself into. That's true. Yes, yes. Third cut on the, on the second side is not filler. It's right. really interesting. It's all about his dad, you know, that kind yes. of thing. So when these these bands, after their primes, they release mu- new music, uh, technically the music is either as good or better than some of these songs that were terrible. Right. Like, you're, son of, you're no son of mine. But because we're not listening to them 98 times and talking ourselves into it, we just hear it once. We're like, eh, yeah, not that good. And then you never, that's it. You've written it off. And I worry about in this iTunes era, I worry about people are just going to cherry pick the songs they like. And I know I do it. There's never going to be a Your Son of Mine. Nobody's going to have these experiences with bad songs that they talk themselves into. Why do you have to talk to yourself into a bad song? I think, I think that young people still commit to artists in a way that it's harder for people of our age to do. I think we're much more likely to cherry-pick that stuff. And Really? But, but when you're young, you'll still buy into the ethic of an entire group. You know? You'll still say, you know, like, I'm the Radiohead guy, or I'm, you know, all my references will be 10 years out of date, so you shouldn't listen to me. But, you know, I'm, you know, I'm down with this band. These are my guys. And, yeah. and you'll, you'll listen to every cut, and you'll find the rarities, and you'll find the B-sides, and you'll find the one thing that they played in Cleveland that they never played again. And, mm, I, and I say I worry about that happening. And you'll buy in, you know. That's I don't the, know. We just don't, we don't have room in our lot, you know. We were lucky to have great guys like Bruce and stuff, you know, but but we don't necessarily have room for the new guys, nor should we. They're addressing their music to other people. But I still think that young people will will go, yep, that's my guy. Yep, that's, that's you know, I'm listening to everything that person does from now on. So Okay, here's my counter. Sure. If that was true, then why is the CD dying? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's expensive. And it takes to, you know, instant gratification takes too long. You know, you go on the web and, you know, you don't have to wait to. You just made my point. You don't, you know, you, you just can't wait, you know. But on the, at the same time, it lets you get all this stuff that you used to have to swap people for, you know. If you're inventive enough, you can find all those things that you had to know somebody to, to find just by trolling around on the web, you know. If there's some fish concert that you really loved that they played in Vermont when the rain was coming in, you can probably find it, you know, hmm. rather than having to go to the, you know, the swap meet and find the, you know, f- find the conspiracy theorist with the box of cassette tapes, you know. The biggest, the the band that, the band that with the fans that missed out the most with the internet era was the Grateful Dead when Jerry was alive. 
the internet would have, <laughs> the internet would have mobilized these people like maybe nothing we've ever. It seen. would have created the internet. I mean, yeah, you know, in a way, you feel like you know, <laughs> you know, it's like whatever the secular version of pornography is. Like, yeah. like if they could have met, you know, if if Mark Cuban had been a Grateful Dead fan. Yeah. Like, like, like the internet would have like all happened ten years earlier. That's a good point. Um, all right, let's talk about Tribeca quickly. So Absolutely. You're hosting on Friday at five o'clock at the SVA Theater on three thirty third West twenty third Street. Theater you're all two. over this, yeah. Theater two. You're hosting a panel um, of four filmmakers who are participating in our thirtieth anniversary project that launches this summer. That's or, I'm right. sorry, this September. Um, it's called 30 for 30. What we did was we gave 30 documentaries to 30 people, all of whom are Hollywood filmmakers and legitimate filmmakers, not people like, oh yeah, this guy's cousin wants to make a movie. So we gave one to him. Like these are all big time people. Yeah. So you're doing this panel with Dan Clores, who did black magic for us and that's, is doing a Reggie Miller documentary for 30 for 30. That's right. You're doing Bar- uh, Barbara Koppel is yep. also on it. She's done a whole host of stuff. I, I forget what she's doing for this, though. She's Remember? doing the Steinbrenners, I think. That's right, Steinbrenners. Yeah. Um, Barry Levinson, who's directed a whole bunch of movies, including Rain Man, one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, and Oscar Diner. Winner, yeah. He's done uh, a slew of classics. Avalon. And, and he is grew up in Baltimore, and he is doing a documentary on... The Departure of the Cults, I believe. Yes, which broke his heart. Yes. And then finally, Albert Maisel's design, who is probably... Top five or six famous documentarians ever. Yeah. Um, and this was this is really cool. And what we want to do with Thirty for Thirty, and it was it was something that I helped develop. We wanted to tell stories that people might not necessarily know. You know, we didn't want to just do thirtieth anniversary. Right, we're doing OJ trial. We're going to do Jordan. We're going to do Magic. Like right. we actually want to tell stories that that were stories and would read like something. I don't know, like almost like a column or a feature or something. Well, we, yeah, know, I mean, you and I grew up loving this kind of stuff. You know, yes. we love the long form features in magazines like Inside Sports, you know, and, and when the Gary Smiths, you know, would, would wheel one out for Sports Illustrated. And we loved, you know, sports documentaries, you know, Man Called Lombardi or anything like right. that. And so, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to tell the, these stories at some length. But as you say, I mean, you know, people responsible for Harlan County, USA and and Gimme Shelter, you know, the, some yeah. of the great documentaries of the last, you know, 45 years. So it's it's very exciting. And, the you know, the cool thing, we were hoping this would happen. Basically, the goal was to try to get four famous people to commit and then it would be like a domino effect. And that's kind of what happened. Mm-hmm. But we also when when we were meeting with different people. You know, we we had a list of topics we were hoping we'd hit. Man, we hope I hope we can get a Jordan. I hope I hope somebody's has a take on OJ. Whatever, but we weren't going to force him. Right. And what we were banking on was that maybe these people would have stories that were important to them. Yeah. And we just want to let them do it. The Albert Mazel's thing was amazing. So, you know, I really had wanted to do one on Ali Holmes because I just thought that was one of the the lost tragic events. Oedipus at Colonna. Yeah, it was just, you know, you have sports writers sitting ringside crying. Yeah. Like, when does that ever happen in a sporting event? This guy just well, Occasionally gets... they take away the, you know, the buffet table early. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they ran out of Cheetos God, and they start crying. That, yeah. no, that was funny. Um, and it's something that I don't think a lot of people know. And there was that iconic Sports Illustrated cover of Ali just sitting on his, on his uh, stool. Yeah. Just his face is a mess and it's so sad and so tragic. I don't even think they ran a headline. Um, so anyway, we, we, we meet with Albert Maisel, Maisel's, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it turns out he followed Ali for a documentary about fighting Larry Holmes and was with him for the four months leading up to the fight. And then the fight ended so badly and so unhappily yeah. that it was buried. And then yeah, like, yeah, yeah, nobody at the this. time could stand to watch it. Yeah. yeah, nobody wanted to see this. It was like watching the worst. No, you know, nobody's going to – you're not going to buy – sell this. Nobody's going to go see it. So that's yeah. it. So it's been in this – in whatever, his warehouse. It was the Flight 93 of, uh, you know, documentaries. Exactly. So 30 years later, here it is – or 29 years later, hey, can you recut that into something? So – I, I just think this is going to be a really cool thing. No, I'm fa- you know, no, I'm fascinated by all these, you know, all these projects coming from the heart or coming from things that we kind of mm-hmm. forgotten about or, 
you know, just real, like filmmakers with just great eyes going inside, you know, the world of the Steinbrenners. Or Chloris taking that, you know, taking how many seconds was that, you know, the, the you know, Reggie Miller just going off yep. against the Knicks and you know, really opening it up and, and, and checking that out. So four different are, you know, four different filmmakers, four totally different approaches, uh, four different backgrounds. But the thing that unites them is really interesting stories and, uh, and evident talent on the filmmaking side. Yeah, I, I'm really excited. And it just, just personally, I'm excited to watch all these. You know, I watched the Thriller Manila documentary that HBO did last week. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a couple minor problems with it. I thought it was too skewed toward Frazier, which I know was their intent that nobody's ever told the story from Frazier's side. But I felt like they bent the facts a little against Ali. Um, but overall, an awesome 90 minutes to spend. Just, I don't know if you've seen it yet. But I just, haven't seen it, actually, no. And I, I do remember hearing that it was... Was it Mark Cram who still who yes. sort of put out the first, you know? He wrote the book. He right, wrote Cram the book put out about... the book, and 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 obviously, you know, when Nick Toshis did um, Sonny Liston, there was a bit of that revisionist history too, with regard to Liston and Ali. So the idea is out there; it's perfectly credible, and Frazier doesn't probably get nearly enough, you know, nearly enough sunshine for for what he did, but. Uh, right. but and still, Frazier is still he's so bitter even to this day. Like on his cell phone, he has this really. Um, Derisive comment about Ali on it, basically that Ali won the fight, but Frazier won the war. And right. He, you know, look at him and look at me, and, and this is a guy who is extraordinarily bitter. Thirty-four years later, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, but and it was it, neat. It's a, it's maybe about fifteen minutes too long, but it was a really cool take on something that I think everybody had kind of digested and moved on from. Right. And hopefully that's what we'll be able to do with thirty for thirty. Like for instance. You saw Cocaine Cowboys, right? Uh, yes, I did. It was it was very good, and those guys for for thirty for thirty are doing a Miami University documentary. Oh, uh, about the um, all the stuff. Wow, everything, and that should be awesome. We limited it's so it'll be fifty two minutes. That's how long these will be. So we'll but see. It's, how not, it it's not necessarily a lot of time. It makes you have to work. Yeah, it makes you have to work harder to get it all in. But I, I, in my opinion, a positive in a lot of ways. Like I felt like the uh, the Frazier documentary could have been shorter. Okay. So I, I would say the ideal time is somewhere between fifty two and a hundred and uh, maybe sixty five minutes for a doc. You go ninety. That's yeah. You really have to have something meaty at that point. You know what I mean? Or you have yeah. You have to go multiple parts by then. Then you're yeah. talking world at war or something. Yeah. Well, the one I'm really excited about. Um, an idea that I, I you know, really the only idea that that I was really passionate about us doing was about the '92 Dream Team, and it looked like it wasn't going to happen for a long time. And now it seems like, hopefully, the the our friends at NBA Entertainment are going to be able to pull this off. They have all this rare footage nobody's seen of the practices and the scrimmages, and you know they have they have apparently have footage of the famous scrimmage where. Everybody decided it was on. Right. Magic, Magic was the captain of one team. Michael was the captain of the other team. And it got heated and it got personal and they went at it. And it's supposedly the greatest basketball game ever played. Um, well, you know, like supposedly if, we have if footage one, of that. If, yeah, if one quarter of that story is true, you know, it's something anybody would want to see, right? It's something you'd kill to hear about and, and, and hear about in detail and stuff. I would hope so. So we're starting in uh, – You'll be able to see these shows starting in September, but in the meantime, Tribeca on Friday, Chris Connolly hosting a panel. I will be there. Um, more importantly, Connor Shaw, a.k.a. Connor Shell, his real name, will be there. And uh, if you want to bug him about how he doesn't like when my friends come on the podcast, you can just come up to him. <laughs> you can come up to him on the panel and just berate him. So it's Friday, April 24th, 5 o'clock p.m., SVA Theater, West 23rd Street. And also, on Thursday night, um, we're running the Tiant documentary, yes. which is something that was done by John Hawk, who is really, really super talented. He's also doing the 30 for 30. But um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the Tiant documentary. Oh, you haven't seen yet. it yet? I haven't seen it yet, no. So Tiant goes back to Cuba and hasn't been back in like, I don't know, 45 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just forget what an incredible life this guy had. A Cuban refugee comes over, becomes a huge hero. 1975 World Series. Yep. 
Castro, in an unprecedented move, lets his dad come to America to see his son pitch. Wow. And this was, you know, we go to the big, the stories that would have been bigger now than they were at the time. Like, that would have been a pretty big story if it happened now. How many pitches did he throw in that game? Well, in game four, he threw like 175 pitches. But in game one, which was the game his dad was right. at, they won 6 nothing. He had the famous play where he's running around the bases in his warm-up jacket like Laurel and Hardy. Right. And scores the run, throws a shutout, and... uh Anyway, it's it's a very good documentary. If you have nothing to do Thursday night, I, I, I it listened to his. Uh, I listened to the first game he ever pitched on radio. Louis Tien. Yeah, he was playing for the Cleveland Indians, and he pitched against the Yankees. He beat the Yankees like uh, six to one. And what I remember about it was, I think it was the second game of a doubleheader. What I remember about it is that it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody use the word debut. Yeah. <laughs> and Red Barber or Mel Allen just kept saying the word debut. For Louis Tion, so well, Peter Gammons, who's 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 uh, knowledge of baseball and history and all that stuff, like he's just been there. Yes, and I, I don't think he would make a statement like this lightly. He said that the crowds for Louis in that seventy-two to seventy-five stretch just completely dwarfed the Pedro experience that came twenty-five years later. Hmm. And that it was like you know they didn't have the fire laws back then, so the place was just packed. And people were just eating it up, and the crowd was swaying on every pitch, and there's never been a more popular Red Sox, in his opinion. That's that interesting. That was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so that's Thursday night. Look uh, forward to seeing you in town, Bill. On Friday, I will see you then. Chris Connolly, as always, a pleasure. Thank you very much, Bill. Talk to you soon. Take care. So I get the sun off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. You laughed, you cried, you turned up the sound repeatedly, and now it's over. Thus concludes another installment of the BS Report. And with all the talk about sports, Bill Simmons neglected to mention this important just-breaking news. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. <clears throat> With Subway Everyday Value, many of your Subway favorites will continue to be $5 footlongs. And when you buy any footlong, you can get any Subway dollar footlong sidekick for just a dollar each or less. Choose from any of the dollar footlong sidekicks, like refreshing 21-ounce drinks, creamy yogurt, crisp apple slices, chips, and two cookies. See store for details.